this is CIBE 633, Environmental Hydrology. And today is uh, Thursday, October 21st of 2021. And the subject today is uh, lake restoration. And I'm going to be pointed, pointedly be talking about the Southern Sea its history, it, it, the, the situation, and so forth. Um, one of you uh, are, is going to be presenting a, a report on the Southern Sea at the end of this class, so we'll be looking forward to what he says. Um, at this point, I'm going to share the uh, I'm going to share the screen that I have in here pre prepared. Okay, so I am going to be talking about three or four pieces of work that we have done over the over, over time and interspersed with work from with from some other people. But the first paper I have is this one, which I call Time Engineering, the singular case of the Salton Basin. So time engineering is a concept that uh, applies to any project that is basically driven by the geomorphology. Because engineers think in terms of a thousand years, we can even get to 10,000 years, but we do not go further than that. Although there are some exceptions and I will point that out to you later on. Uh, but time engineering is a concept that relates to the effect of geomorphology on engineering decisions, long-term decisions. So we developed this concept uh, after having an experience in Colombia, which I think I was mentioning to you that there's a gentleman out there that is doing some um, um, fixing some meanders in some of the eastern Colombian rivers in the Amazon or close to the Amazon. And the issue is that the meanders are moving, oh, the rivers are have, have a general tendency to meander, and as they meander, they move around and they basically encroach upon the, the highways that are around the river. Uh, so that uh, society doesn't like that because basically the river will have the capability to destroy the highway. It, that would either have to realign, send somewhere else, or else you fight the river, which is what they've been doing in Colombia fairly successfully, I would say. Uh, my friend uh, has told me that he has done about 20 projects in 20 years and one of them failed. Yes, a couple, three years ago. Uh, so, time engineering then is the engineering that is carried out for a specific purpose of buying or obtaining an indefinite time from nature. The Southam Basin is a classical case of time engineering. Let me increase the size in here so that it'll be a little better. What is the Southern Basin? It's a geological depression located in southeastern California and northeastern Baja California in Mexico, uh, lying partially below sea level. So it is a depression. It's a graben, actually. Graben is a, is a German, German term that refers to a depression, geologic depression between two faults. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later in more detail. Uh, the region is endorheic. And the rake meaning, from a geomorphological perspective, has no outlet to the sea. There's, it's, it's landlocked. Given the location of the southern end of the basin in Baja California, immediately west of the mouth of the mighty Colorado River, time had in store a different fate for the region. In geologic time, and I'm going to be talking here in general about geologic time. Uh, engineers usually don't get into geologic time. Only when they deal with the geologists, which we often do, then they tell us, well, you know, a million years ago, a hundred million years ago, and it's kind of hard for us to relate to that because we're not trained to think in those terms, but they are. Uh, so I'm going to be talking like, a, like if I were a geologist today a little bit. Allow me that latitude. So in geologic time, the Colorado River has deposited sufficient amounts of sediment near its mouth to form a natural barrier, thus effectively separating the Southern Basin from the Gulf of California. In other words, um, 
uh, geomorphologists have studied this, and they have come to the conclusion that the southern basin was one and the same with the Gulf, maybe 15, 20 million years ago. Not, we don't know the exact precise date, but that is, in fact, what actually had happened. Um, as the Colorado River flowed into its mouth in the vicinity of Yuma, Yuma, Arizona, and Yuma, California. Yuma, you know, the city of Yuma is right in the middle. There's a Yuma, California, which is a small town, and then there's a Yuma, Arizona, which is a larger, much larger town. The prevailing hydraulic gradients indicate that the river could flow either north towards the southern basin or south towards the Gulf of California. So it's, if the river turned right, it was, it was going to go to the U.S. If it turned left, it was going to go to Mexico. It's because Yuma is precisely right at the border, okay? Depending on the variations of flow of water and sediments, and the shape of the promontory, the shape of the promontory will determine that. And the shape was determined in time, in geologic time, by chance. It could go one way, it could go the other. Now, let's bring in the history of what has actually happened in the last 120 years. Until the late 1800s, the portion of the southern basin located north of the U.S.-Mexico border was known as the Colorado Desert. It was a very large desert, nothing in there. Around the year 1900, as a matter of fact, precisely at the year 1900, on the year 1900, 121 years ago, this name was changed to Imperial Valley because uh, people that uh, helped to develop the, the Colorado Desert thought that they weren't going to be uh, convincing anybody to come to a Colorado desert. But if, it, if, it, if, it, if they changed the name to Imperial Valley, maybe they would. And they were rather very successfully, uh, they very successfully convinced a lot of people, mostly from the Midwest and the, uh, in the east of the United States, to come and settle in that area and farm. That was the idea. You can farm the desert if you only had water. And the water presumably was coming with the Colorado River. The Colorado River drains, it's the third largest um, uh, hydrologic basin in the United States after the Mississippi and the Columbia, and it drains the states, it drains seven states as a matter of fact, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, etc. Okay, with a secure source of water from the Colorado, the desert turned out to be very fertile. But this is the key to this whole thing. It was very fertile due in part to its mild climate. It could have two, three, and some people argue that it could even have four growing seasons in one year. But the thing about it is that it also was fertile because of its abundant supply of juvenile nutrients, meaning nutrients that had never been reused or recycled. Strong nutrients, let's put it that way. If we, could, if we could talk about it in those terms. Now, the disadvantage, however, and here's the key to this whole thing, that perhaps when this was started 121 years ago, the people that started this either did not know or they knew it, but they didn't pay too much attention to it. So the disadvantage is that in arid lands, increased agricultural productivity always leads to an increase in the amount of drainage salts. In other words, the package. The package is big. You have to throw the package. You can't eat the package. Therefore, over the, la of the past 100 years, the saline waste from the Imperial Valley has accumulated in the surrounding depression to form the Southern Sea. Indeed, a man-made monument to the intense agricultural activity that has taken place in the area since then. So for 120 years, roughly 120 years, say 100, uh, the waste from the Imperial Valley, the agricultural residues or agriculture, it's called agricultural sewage uh, from the Imperial Valley has accumulated in the surrounding depression to form the Southern Sea. Now, this is not like, uh, like uh, sewage from, from people, from population, but it's still sewage because it's something that, that we don't like, we don't want. And it actually does smell, perhaps not exactly like uh, the familiar smell that we are familiar with when we go to the bathroom, but it does have some smell in there, different types of constituents 
are form part of the agricultural waste. So that is our abstract. So today we are going to be talking about time engineering, and then we're going to confront it or compare it to frequency-based design. And then we're going to be specifically talking about the case of the Southern Basin. And finally, we're going to be closing our remarks or making our closing remarks on this subject of how does time engineering uh, relate or the concept of time engineering relates to the Southern Basin. What is engineering? In engineering, we design something. It's an artificial system designed by human beings. It is quite distinct from a natural system because we use, basically in engineering, we use physics and chemistry. Physics to a large extent and chemistry to a little extent. In environmental engineering, though, we also use biology. So environmental engineering kind of coalesces all three natural sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology. So we design a system to perform a task or service to satisfy a perceived societal need. Something needs to be solved. We come in, we get hired, we think through things, and we look at what other people have done in other places all over the world, and we design something. We design a dam, we design a levee, we design an agricultural system, we design a power plant, and so on and so forth. Engineer, engineering uses physical, chemical, and biological principles. The principles. The focus is on performance. You want the system to have a certain acceptable performance, not to get ruined in a few years. It has to last a little while. How long? This is what we're here to talk about. Okay. The design life is the expected time counted from system inception and typically measured in years. They would have to pass before, before the system loses its intended function, function, at which time it is repaired, replaced, or retired. Buildings, for instance, here in, a, in the United States are replaced every 50 years, 50, 60 years. I think the technology kind of gets old. Uh, there is all uh, a, a complete uh, industry of uh, bringing down buildings so that to replace them. You've seen that before. It's shown in the media. So they're repaired, or re typically buildings are not repaired. Other structures could be repaired, could be re-engineered on site like a dam and so forth, or they are simply retired. We have had uh, a lot of projects of deconstruction here in California. De deconstruction dams have been in business for almost 20 years now. There used to be construction of dams. The era of dam construction in California was from the 1900s to the 1990s. At about that time, it kind of stopped, came to a halt. And then the era of deconstruction started. The old dams were being replaced. They were being obliterated, removed physically. Some dams were actually physically removed. Uh, you know, every iota, every part was removed. The sediment they collected behind them was removed, put somewhere else, and so forth. So uh, institutions make decisions as to what to do with the projects. Time engineering, we define in here as the engineering which has the specific purpose of buying time from nature. Buying some time from nature. Geologic time, let's talk about that because many people are not familiar with this. Geologic time is nature's clock. Human time is a fraction of it. The earth was formed, uh, people that know the subject, uh, the geologists, the volcanologists, uh, say that it, it, the Big Bang occurred about 4.6 billion years ago. In other words, 4.6 times 10 to the 9. Yet the entire time span of human civilization is estimated at about 10,000 years. Actually, I should put in there 11,000 because we know now for sure that the Chinese civilization started at about 11,000 years in China. Uh, the Western cultures, so so called, wouldn't start for another five thousand years. In the meantime, the Indians, the Indian culture was already developing. But the one ones we're familiar with here in Western culture started about six thousand years ago in Iraq, in the Mesopotamia. Um, so that, as you can see, amounts to barely a point zero 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 two percent of geologic time, hardly anything.
Of course, it's very important for us. We're talking about 10,000 years, and then, um, and then we will be talking about our own lifetime, which is a much smaller. So let's do that. Let's compare those, those numbers. The time frame of human existence, where a generation typically spans 25 years. Yes, generation, everybody says 25 years. And a human life may last an average of three generations. People get to be 75 now. Uh, Professor Pons is already up there. Uh, it's also small compared to the time span of human civilization. The number of human generations in the time span of civilization is about 400. You can take 10,000 over 25 years and get 400. So in other words, in the 10,000 years since things started to develop in the world in terms of civilization, not in terms of the development of the species, of our own species, our own species have, has been dated at around 200,000 years. That means that when we became a species was 200,000 years ago, and it took 190,000, that's 95% uh, of that time for us to become civilized. Okay, so you can see now how the time factor enters into our reasoning in here. So, the ratio of time span of civilization to time span of an individual's life, which could be 50 to 75, would be 200, roughly 200. So the time of humans is relatively small compared to the time of history. And in turn, the time of history is small compared to the time. It's just simply to all time. So in terms of time, uh, our existence obviously very minute. But it's very important for us because we're here and we're living it, right? And so uh, we kind of refer back to the history, both, uh, both uh, social history as well as geologic history, or the planet's history, but that's in the background. So we are now going to try to put it into the fore foreground so that, you can, so that we can come up with better understanding of what's actually going on and how can we face the problem, or at least how, did we, how could we attempt to fix it, if we could fix it, sometimes problems cannot be fixed. Okay, this discussion of time engineering is relevant because it is closely linked to the issue of sustainability. Everybody's talking about sustainability these days. I would venture to say that there's very few people out there that claim to be not sustainable. They could be, but they don't want to claim it because it's not the right thing to do at this time or to say at this time. So what should be the time frame of sustainable engineering design? In other words, should we design for how long should we design? And I pose a question in there, four generations? Four generations is 100 years. And I'm going to talk about extensively about that number, by the way. Is it four generations? or oh, that's too small. Maybe 40 generations? That's 1,000 years. 400 generations? 400 generations is already 10,000 years. So that's the entire span of civilization as we know it or ideally the maximum possible. You can ask the question of people, how long do you think this project should last? And some people say 100 years, others say 1,000, and others say, well, we want it to last forever, whatever that means. Of course, that's unrealistic, really unrealistic. But at any rate, there's some people that, that argue that sustainability means forever. I kind of don't agree with it because forever is too strong of a, a word to use. We don't even know. So these issues are addressed here with reference to the case of the Southern Basin. The Southern Basin, the Southern Sea. Southern is relates to salt because there's a lot of salt out there. It used to be Southern Basin, and then about 120 years ago, it became the Southern Sea. So not too many people talk about the Southern Basin anymore. Only the, the geologists and the people like myself that have studied it so the Southern Basin is the background of the Southern Sea. It was basin before, and then it became sea about 120 years ago. So let's briefly review the concepts of frequently based design, because I, we would like to relate that to what we're saying, what we have said earlier about time engineering. Now, the concept of frequency based design is well established. When did it get established? Well, we started designing dams about 140 years ago, and we had to figure out how long it was going to last. 
we know that there's loads out there that could obliterate the, da the, the dam in no time. Well, we got to figure that out from a statistical standpoint. How probable is a flood of certain magnitude, right? And those calculations are, are the bread and butter of hydrolo hydrologists and hydraulic, hydrologic engineers, how to figure out the frequency. Interestingly, though, um, there's two ways to do this. Either it, one of them is statistical and the other one is kind of stochastic or physically based. The statistical was in vogue many at the, from the beginning, from the 1910s, when uh, people like Fuller and uh, Pearson started developing the frequency methods, the frequency-based uh, hydrology, we have had these methods for about 110 years. Unfortunately, they are becoming obsolete because of the issue that uh, the, the data has lost this pristine character. What does that mean? That's a fancy phrase. The data has lost this pristine character. It means that the data that was collected over 100 years is not, is not good anymore because the, the process has changed. We have changed the process. Actually, we contributed to, the, to what we call global warming or global climate change, and therefore the data of 100 years, it, it's, it's to be measured with a different ruler. We have a different ruler now. And we, I think most people accept that as a fact of science. Some don't, as a matter of fact. I think there is still a 5% uh, of the population of the United States, 5 to 10%, perhaps even more. That varies, by the way. You can ask different people, they give you different numbers. They, they do not believe in global climate change. The majority population does, but there's a few, I, I would call it recalcitrants, that uh, just refuse to accept uh, the facts like, uh, like the Keeling curve. They said, oh, we don't want to believe it. Even though Keeling spent his life measuring that, that, that uh, the fact that uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was indeed increasing from its original value in 1958 when he started measuring this when he was a young man. Then he died, I believe, in the year 2008 uh, after spending 50 years measuring the Keeling curve, which was called Keeling right after he, he passed away. Okay, in hydraulic engineering, the return period of 100 years is normally regarded as a standard return period for average size regional projects. And here we, we are quoting, okay, we quote number one in here, the end notes. These end notes are good, so I'm going to refer to them. I'm hoping that uh, we have the time. Yeah, I think this is important so we can discuss it. Gilbert White, was a professor of uh, geography over at the University of Colorado Boulder. And he was hired in the 50s to tell the Congress, Congress was in the midst of uh, developing the Flood Control Act, or actually writing the Flood Control Act to control floods in the United States. So they asked um, the expert, which was Gilbert White at the time, who's geography, professor of geography, I said, what should the norm be? And, and White got together with his friends over at TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and determined, or I guess it's not determined, that suggested, recommended, that the flood that was not too high or not too low, which, which corresponded to the 100-year flood, was supposed to be the norm. It was something that, even in his own writing, he says in there, it was so large that we didn't want to fight it. We just let it happen. But that concept has changed because now we have taken the 100 year flood as a norm and we are actually attempting to fight it. So you, we fight the 100 year flood, but we do not fight the 200 year flood because if the 200 year flood comes then we give up and we say, well, we were not considering the 200 year flood. So there was an interview uh, prior to um, Gilbert White uh, passing away by Martin Roos, I think it is, or Ross, that uh, long interview, which I invite all of you, if you're interested in the history of hydrology, to read. I, it's for you out there. It's a, it's, a, it's a link. We put it in a link. I found the interview, uh, put it all together in a PDF. Uh, I found the PDF and put it on, our, on my site. We're interested in the history of these things. So Gilbert White said that to Martin Roos. He said in, in, 19, in, page, in page 57. Let's take a look. Let's take, what, let's take a look at what he said explicitly. 
page 57. The question from the interviewer was, how do you take into account the so-called catastrophic flood, the once in 100 year flood? I do not consider a 100 year flood catastrophic, but I mean, I guess they did, okay? Because things have changed since Wilbur White was writing this stuff in the, in the 50s. So it's been 60 years ago, no, 70 years ago. So this is what Gilbert White said to the, Professor White said to the interviewer. He said, there was a very interesting development of the notion that there could be a flood of sufficiently low frequency that no effort should be made to cope with it. How fascinating, things have changed now. We are actually trying to cope with the 100 year flood. Federal insurance picked 1% of a recurrence. That means one in 100 years. And some of us were involved in that because we recognized that initially they had, they had to have some figure. Congress was not asking for talk. They wanted a number. They hired him to give him a number. So we see what kind of force to give him a number. The 1% flood was chosen. And then it's kind of interesting how he describes it. He says, I think Jim Goddard and TVA colleagues would be considered parties to the crime. With the lack of any other figure, the concept taken from TVA's intermediate regional flood seem a moderately reasonably figure. We generally use the term catastrophic flood for events of much lesser frequency, meaning 500, 1,000, even up to 10,000. Okay, so that is Gilbert White. Okay, now we go in here. Do we use lower return periods? Yes, we use 10 for design of, for design of, um, of culverts. 10, 25 years, smaller projects such as culverts. Why? Because there are so many culverts and the culverts cover a small area. And the chance for a small area to be hit by a big flood is, is not likely because it's a small area, right? So one thing leads to another, and we actually are in practice, are in, in hydrologic design practice, are actually designing culverts for 10 and 25 years, sometimes even less. In other words, the culverts will fail. But there's a thousand culverts out there, and only two or three fail, so it's no big deal. It has never happened where you have a thousand culverts and all of them fail. Actually, I don't think that, that ever has happened. Okay, that brings uh, a case in point of an example that I have told on the web, even in a, uh, on a video. I'm gonna put the video for you to see. Let me write it down because I will forget if I, if I don't write it down. There was a, a, a professor over in Mexico City who was in charge of all the bridges. Video on earthquake. He was in charge of all the bridges. He was a big guy. He had a, written a book and he was a professor. I think he had about, a thousand bridges around Mexico, and they had a big, big earthquake back in the year, I believe in 1985, they had a very strong earthquake. And uh, three of the 1,000 bridges were destroyed. So then he called in, in his staff for a consultation for study. And, um, and the staff was, uh, was concerned that he was going to explic explicitly talk about the three bridges that had failed. And uh, his name was Rodriguez. Professor Rodriguez said, no, I want to talk about the 997 that didn't fail because these, this, this earthquake was one in 100 years, recurrence, strength. And the bridges that we're designing are designed for one in 50, so 50 year frequency design, because there's so many bridges. You can't, you cannot, you, uh, every 50, they decided it was 50 years, the design lifetime. So in his book, they, all of them should have failed. But he was kind of joking, uh, taking it with a grain of salt because it just doesn't happen that way. As I already told you in, in culverts, the, 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 the same thing does happen. Okay, in the case of dams, where failure may lead to loss of life, return periods up to 10,000 years, and sometimes even larger, have been considered. Now, 10,000 years is a standard for more than 50, 60 years. However, around the middle 60s, uh, beginning of the 1960s, the, um, the agencies that are in charge of 
hydrology uh, or statistic of hydrology in the United States, namely the National Weather Service, decided that they could not rely on the data and the data was chancy and God, God, they didn't even know at the time that 60 years later they would have to basically throw it away. So then they said, we're gonna develop a deterministic way. We're not gonna based on distant statistics. We're gonna figure it out how much water is there and how much of that water could precipitate in any one situation given the local conditions and so forth. So they created at the time what has been referred to widely as the probable maximum precipitation, which has nothing to do with statistics. It's a meteorological assessment of how much could it rain given time, given space, in a certain latitude, et cetera. And the United States uh, promptly de dedicated themselves to the National Weather Service, U.S. National Weather Service, to calculate the PMP throughout the United States. And they spent 30 or 40 years doing that. By the end of the last century, they had calculated the PMP everywhere. Interestingly, though, other countries in the world don't have the technical wherewithal of the United States, so they didn't do it. Like Mexico and other places, they didn't do it. So they still rely on the 10,000 year assessment because we figure that 10,000 years is a heck of a lot. It's, it's 400 generations. Um, uh, we pay our own way. We can pay three generations, four generations, 100 years is four generations. If you, put, if you put a dam together right now and you amortize it in 10 or 15 years, whatever it is, then eventually it's going to be free for the rest of the people that, go, that come behind you. As a matter of fact, we have 13 or 12, 13 dams here in San Diego. Many of them are 100 years old, so therefore they've been fully paid. They're still giving us water. Our, our grandparents paid for them, but we're still using them. And there are some of them are good, still good enough. Some of them are not good and they're being repaired. But as you can see, this issue of how long are you going to uh, build a structure for, not only is a technical subject, but also an economic subject. So that's the issue here. So 10,000 years some, it, some, is something that is reasonable, particularly when you're looking at dams at the flood towns. You don't want a dam to fail. If the dam is an earthen embankment, it could fail, and dams have failed, and they will flood the downstream towns and so on and so forth. People have been killed and so forth. So the, that's how the probable maximum precipitation was developed. I have a reference in there to three, which is a fascinating and interesting reference. No, it's to two. The reference is to two. And I'm going to go back in here, and I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to I'm going to read to you the excerpt an excerpt that I put up this morning on the ASCE uh, external review panel after, for the Katrina event after Katrina the Hurricane Katrina in the year 2007 ASCE set up um, a committee of experts to figure out what had happened and the problem was not really hydrologic it was mostly geotechnical because the levees were walls of concrete, thin wall of concrete. So in a thin wall of concrete, if you put water on one side and no water on the other side, which is exactly what happened, the, the thing could tip depending on the soil. If the soil's too weak, then it will tip. So the, the report determined that um, that's exactly what had happened, that it was a geotech, uh, a slight failure from a geotechnical standpoint. Interestingly enough, the people I'm given to understand that most of the people that participated in the writing of this report were either, either straight civils or geotechs. And I'm not sure if they had any hydrologists out there in the group. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, not, I don't know all of them. There were about 10 people in that in their committee. And they wrote this, which gives me to believe that there were no hydrologists in the report, okay, participating in the report. Let's read this, this sentence because it's interesting. Straight out of the ASCE uh, external review panel report on the Katrina hurricane. Relative to what people are generally willing to accept or tolerate for dams, the level of risk for the, to the residents of New Orleans was very high. For instance, if the hurricane protection system had been treated as a major dam, it would have needed to be designed so that the likelihood of failure would have been roughly once in 100,000 years to once in one million. 
That leads me to believe that whoever wrote this was not a hydrologist, because typical, typically hydrologists don't go above 10,000. And this gentleman went up to, gentleman, whoever wrote this thing went up to 100,000, and he even had the nerve to go up to 1 million. So I put that in there to show you that nothing's perfect in this world. There's, there's errors out there, and we got to see the errors through our knowledge that we have so that we can come up with the real, the real answer. And we've been doing this throughout. I've been pointing to, out to you the errors in the writings of the very top people that we have in hydrology. Just a minute here. Okay, so let's go back in here. Are, we, are you guys watching, uh, I mean, seeing the, the paper now? So we talk about frequently based design, okay? Frequency-based design differs from time engineering in one important respect. Frequency-based is an arbitrary limit after which failure is to be expected. On the other hand, time engineering does not define the time to failure. Instead, it borrows from geologic time an undefined relatively small amount of time in order to provide an economic value to society. This is exactly what has happened in the case of the Salton Basin and the Salton Sea. In hydraulic engineering, time engineering has a distinct geomorphological flavor. And next week, we're going to start on the chapter on geomorphology that I wrote three or four years ago. It's a very comprehensive. It's about 80 pages long. It's going to take us a week to review that paper. It's a long paper. While the time span of geomorphological processes is measured in millions of years, or hundreds of millions even, that of the human experience might be in most several thousand years. We can't really relate to a, a 10 million years. This time scale difference places at odds natural laws with the realities of the socioeconomic world. In other words, they're totally at odds. You can't say, oh, we're going to wait 100 million years for this to happen. Natural processes will still take place, but it may take too long, long enough to be of little consequence to human society, meaning in terms of decision making. But of consequence, it is, definitely, because it could happen at any time. We just don't know. We're just gambling that it's not going to happen. Thus, a deliberate decision is made to sidestep the laws of nature and forego its long-term consequences. In other words, we're running a risk here because the probability is low. Let's take a look at the case of the Southern Basin. Significant case study of time engineering is that of the Southern Basin. Geologic depression between two faults. That is, in German, it's a graben, and, and that word is used in, in English, by the way. We have borrowed it from, from the German language located in southeastern California and lying partly below sea level. From a geomorphological perspective, the region is endorheic, which no outlet to the sea. Millions of years ago, what happened was that this thing depressed. It went down. The lowest um, point of the Salton Basin is at minus 287 feet, which is about 90, 91 meters below sea level. Okay, millions of years ago, the entire Southern Basin used to be part of the Gulf of California, which reached, reached northward a distance of about 250 kilometers, ending in the proximity of what is now the city of Indio in Riverside County. In other words, you see here, here's the location. This is the Gulf of California. The Gulf was coming over here through Mexicali, then across the border, this yellow, yellow line in here is the border between the U.S. and Mexico, and then going north all the way about uh, I don't know, about 100 miles to this, the city of India, which is kind of a little bit, maybe 5, 10 miles north of the northern edge of the Salton Sea. Okay. Given the location of, of the basin's southernmost extremity in Baja California, Mexico, immediately west of the mouth of the mighty Colorado, a different destiny was surely in store for the region. And those are kind of nice words, but this is exactly what happened. We got in here the Colorado coming from here, and the Colorado comes from Colorado, comes from Utah, comes from Arizona. It goes through the Grand Canyon. It erodes a heck of a lot of sediment. How many years? The Grand Canyon is largely given an age of about six to eight million years, but give and take a few million years, okay? So it comes over here, and at that point, at this point, it hits right, Yuma is in Arizona, that's cool. That's Yuma, Arizona, the city of Yuma. It's a large town out there. I don't know the population, but I'm, I would guess that Yuma is about at least 100,000 people out there. Okay, so then it goes into Mexico right here, right here. Can you see him on the mouse? It goes into Mexico. And then at, at that point, 
it has no choice due to geomorphology, due to prevailing geomorphology, but spread out. So it spreads out in Mexico over right here. So there is a, um, a cone in here. It's, a, it's an alluvial cone. I wouldn't even call it an alluvial cone. I will call it a, almost a colluvial cone. A colluvial cone is a cone that's not transported. Actually, no, it's not, it's not colluvial. It would be colluvial if it, it, if it generated or, or deposited a sediment that was locally generated. But this sediment's been coming all the way from Colorado. So it's alluvial, correctly, alluvial. So it's an alluvial cone in here, okay? Judging from satellite imagery, the minimum elevation of the mound between Mexicali and the Gulf is about 13 meters. In other words, if you go walking here in this direction, it goes from zero. Zero is right here, zero sea level. Sea level equals zero. And it goes up in here like this, very slowly starts to come up. At about this place, around the location which the Mexicans call the Rio Hardy, and south of the Cerro Prieto plant, the geothermal Cerro Prieto plant, which I believe is around here somewhere, it's where the, the, the gradient, or rather the elevation, reaches about 13 meters elevation above mean sea level, and at that point starts decreasing. And by the time it gets through here, around I-8, which goes through here, Interstate 8, now in California, it reaches zero. So I'm guessing that here is zero, here is 13, and here is zero. It's a mound. It's a perfect mound, okay? And then after it reaches zero, it starts coming down furthermore. We can't see it here. But it gets on all the way to minus 287 feet or else uh, minus 91 meters, okay? Eight and 87 meters. I'm sorry, 87 meters. The elevation of the bottom is 87 meters, which I should, I believe it should correspond with 287 or 278. And my memory now at this point is a little fuzzy. Okay, so that's the geomorphological situation there. Now we know it. Interestingly, though, it's in Mexico, so we're supposed to study. We can study Mexico and so forth, but it's another country. It's another socio socioeconomic condition. It's, it's just about totally different, but it's right in there. The mouth is right there, as you can see. The prevailing hydraulic gradients dictate that the Colorado River could flow either north toward the southern basin or south toward the Gulf of California. In other words, when the Colorado sent a, sent a flood over here, the flood came over here, and at this point it figured out, what, what am I going to do now? Am I going to go right or left? And whether it went, if it went right, it went to the United States. Eventually it go like this. And if it went south, it, left rather, it would go to Mexico. When would it go one or the other? We can't tell. We really can't decide that. The river is going to do what it has to do. Now, what we know, though, is that in the past, before development, like three, four hundred years ago, the river used to go every once in a long while north. Perhaps it was, it was weak in some places, and like every hundred years it flooded north, and every, every, every other year it was flooding south. So that's when the name of Lake Cahuilla, or Cahuilla, Cahuilla, was was created. Lake Cahuilla is the ancient, uh, Calo, uh, the ancient remnant uh, lake of the Southern Sea. But Lake Cahuilla, Cahuilla was natural, while the Southern Sea is artificial. Okay? Okay, so in contrast, uh, judging from satellite imagery, 13 meters in the mound, zero south and Minus, a 90, a minus 87 north. The prevailing hydraulic gradients dictate that the Colorado should flow either north or south, depending on the vagaries of the flow of water and sediment. And this water, this uh, river carries a lot of sediment. That's why it's called Colorado by the Spanish. When the Spanish came into this region in the early 1600s, they saw the Colorado and it was full of sediment and they called it Colorado. And the name kind of stuck. We now have a state in the United States called Colorado, which comes from the Colorado River. The, the uh, headwaters of the Colorado River are in the state of Colorado. We never bothered to change, and there's no reason to change that name. We have a lot of uh, names that go back to that time of, in history. So that's where the name, not only Colorado, but the state of Colorado River, but the state of Colorado originate. 
because of the sediment. Prior to contemporary settlement, meaning prior to the 16-1700s, the southern basin was known to contain Lake Cahuilla, implying that the Colorado did flow, did flow north periodically, with the period of recurrence to be measured in centuries. In centuries. Number six. Archaeologist Malcolm Rogers has examined aboriginal pottery left on shoreline sites and concluded that the lake, because you can do this carbon dating, had been present between eight 1000 and 1500 AD. Subsequent studies have established that there were not one but several high stands of the lake before 1000 and after 1500. High stands because the lake will stop filling, there's nothing to stop it. So it'll fill until it overflows and it has to overflow on the 13 meter mound. So they will flood the entire so called Imperial Desert, uh, uh, Colorado Desert or Imperial Valley now. Not only Imperial Valley, the Mexicali Valley too, which is south of the Imperial Valley. Is the Mexico in Mexico, but at the time, of course, there was no population, quote unquote. There were people out there, natives, but they were not the population that we consider now at this point. So I don't know. I don't know what they did, but they probably were flooded and they had to go somewhere else temporarily, a few years, until the lake, since it wasn't receiving any more water and since the high evaporation rates, it would evaporate. My guess is that it it filled in six months and it evaporated in two or three years. That would be just my rough guess. Okay, a stand in the 17th century. And this, by the way, it's all documented by, Wiki, by Wikipedia. I've documented this on the Wikipedia. Okay, fortunately, I was able to find this map or this graph. It's actually a picture, I believe, because at that time, this was done at the turn of the century. We did not have uh, the fancy stuff that we have right now for imager imagery. So as you can see, this is a picture. For some reason, I I think it has to be. I don't see how. So there's a Colorado over here coming coming down in Arizona. Okay, at this point, it goes south, right? It's right here is the border. So exactly where the border is, I, it's not in here, but this is this is this US, Mexico, US, Mexico, it's some here. It's kind of undefined, but it's around here somewhere. So and as you can see over here it says Imperial Valley, which was named Imperial Valley, and then the Southern Depression over here. That's the shape of the Southern Depression. So the Southern Depression contained salt from the beginning because the water from the Colorado, okay, it brought salt and it was being accumulated. And if you had a filling, even if it dried out, the bottom was full of salt. If it had it filled 10, ten times in a, in a thousand years, the salt will remain. The salt, this, all the salt in the basin has never been carted away. Never. It's been accumulating in there for geologic time, whatever it is. A thousand years, two thousand years, more than that. Okay, so that's the salt in there. Over here, by the way, there's another salt lake, but it is in Mexico. This is called Laguna Salada, which, by the way, does usually doesn't have any water as far as I know. Oh, yeah, not nah, right, because because they don't, they don't, the Mexicans don't put any, the Mexican people don't, don't use the Laguna Salada for waste. They just, it's there because it's there. Okay, so that's, this is a very interesting and explanatory uh, graph that uh, we have been able to pull out. This, this was done by the Reclamation Service. At the beginning, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation was called Reclamation Service. I just got a book. I bought a book yesterday in the pharmacy that uh, explains or describes the involvement of Professor, uh, I'm sorry, President Teddy Roosevelt in the development of the West. So I'm going to read it. I, I'm interested in, in that subject. Now, towards the end of the 19th century, the portion of the Southern Basin north of the U.S.-Mexico border was known as the Colorado Desert. I already said that. In about the year 1900, its name was changed to the Imperial Valley setting the stage for the intense agricultural development that ensued. However, due to the enormous quantity of sediment being transported by the Colorado River, management of the river for irrigation development proved to be a challenge. Now, there's hydraulic engineers out there. They don't know anything about sediment. And there's also sedimentation engineers, which have developed over the last 30 or 40 years since the advent of the book by Banoni, which we, last year, those of you that took sedimentation, 
we examined the Vanoni sedimentation engineering manual, manual, 19, manual 54 of the ASCE. Uh, that was dated 1975. So since 1975, we've had a body of knowledge referred to sedimentation engineering. But this stuff was done in the early 1900s. We could not expect them to have known all this stuff. Einstein, who was the Einstein, the son, Hans Einstein, the son of Albert Einstein, who was discredited with developing the science or the knowledge in sedimentation engineering in the US and around the world, he wrote his paper in 1950. So we could not have known. So I guess what I'm going to say in here is that it was, the situation was a, a kind of miscalculated out of ignorance at the time it was done. We just didn't know. Okay. Uh, if we had had the knowledge the, the, of, of today, somebody could have gone out there and measured the sediment that was removed by the Colorado in six, uh, six million years and figured out where, where did it go, a large portion of it. And I have uh, done the calcul this calculation, settled in, in the mound. And part of it just dropped into the, into the Gulf of California. That's kind of what we call sediment yield the yield of the sediment, how much did it actually get to the ocean, some, some of it stuck. I think I already said in sedimentation engineering that thank God that the sediment settled because if it didn't settle, we couldn't find a place where there's soaks in there and then we couldn't farm and we would starve, right? So because of the soil settled somewhere due to geomorphology, we're able to take care of uh, make use of the valleys and their soils. Some valleys have deep soils and therefore it's good. And the soils are the nutrients, and the nutrients are what we eat every day. It's not enough of water. We can't eat water. It has to be water with nutrients. Okay. Uh, an example of the Colorado River at Horseshoe Bend, which I took the trouble when uh, three years ago with a bunch of students. I went over there and actually did a video on this, and I posted the video for you to see. If you haven't been out there, it'd be interesting if you ever had a chance to head out there and visit this Horseshoe Horseshoe Bend on the Colorado. It's close to Glen Canyon, I believe. I believe it's very close to Glen Canyon. Well, the distance is not too far. Because in order to get here, you gotta go through Glen Canyon. So the Colorado River is Horseshoe Bend. As you can see, a lot of sediment. This is interesting because I think in, early in this uh, class, I was saying that the meanders was gonna move. Remember I said that? And my friend was in charge of making sure that they don't move. Well, this meander, because it's car carved on rock and not going anywhere. I do not believe this meander will go anywhere because it's carved on rock. The meanders that are on the alluvial plains that are carved on soils, they can move, but not this one. So this is like, a, you can say an ancient rock meander, which is unusual. Colorado has things like that. Okay, history shows that in 1905, Five years after the enterprise had started, the Colorado River tried once again to reclaim Lake Cahuilla. 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 I think it's in, in, in English is Cahuilla. The Colorado River tried against, tried once again to reclaim Lake Cahuilla. I think I already said, or I had mentioned, and I mentioned this in the sedimentation class, that 1905 was a Nino year. But of course, we didn't know. The Nino was only studied in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Now we know but not at the time. And uh, engineers in charge, among them Rockwood and his associates and many other engineers, I mean, they were, if not privy to the information, they were consulting with the best hydraulic engineers in the United States. They were consulting with the best hydraulic engineers. So we were not short of expertise. So somebody out there figured out that what we should do is to study the record. The record was only 27 years long. So it went back to 1878, which is at the time when, when this area was being formed, was being settled. So they had 27 years of record on the Colorado and they figured, somebody figured out quite, quite uh, interestingly that what they needed to do is wait for the flood. Once the flood happened early in the, in the, in the winter, it wasn't gonna happen again and therefore it had not happened again in 25 years or 27 years. So therefore they could go ahead and safely do whatever they needed to do in the river uh, because at that time it was very, very rudimentary processes of construction that they were using. So they went ahead and did that. 
But little did I know that the Colorado had another flood coming that year. My, I under, my understanding is that, or our understanding is because it was an El Nino year, and an El Nino year is kind of, the situation is kind of odd. So they had another flood and the other flood went out of control and started, it, it turned around and did a U-turn. It came down, it came down to the point. Uh, I don't recall the name of the point, but this is Mexico, by the way, already in Mexico, deep in Mexico, deep in Baja California. And it decided that um, that it didn't go south. It didn't want to go south because it had a mild slope. And what, what it could do though, is turn right and it had a steeper, steeper slope, much steeper slope, and it could go north. And that's exactly what it, the river decided to do in the year two, uh, 1905. And it did it for two years, by the way. It created a huge problem. It was a, a, a flooding problem, a political problem, economic problem, it was terrible. It was a very bad situation, natural. Nature's claim or call there. Um, we thought that we could control the Colorado, but Colorado was saying at the time, no, I can't be controlled, so I'm going to go wherever I want. You guys gave me a path to go. I'm going north. So Colorado went north for two years. Luckily or fortunately, E.H. Harriman, who was in charge of the Southern Pacific, because the Southern Pacific had a state, because if, if their railroad was, was flooded, then they were not going to have any business. So he himself uh, undertook, thank, thanks to him, to fight the Colorado. And in two years, they did whatever was necessary to dump hundreds of thousands of rock, uh, weight, uh, uh, pounds of rock that they brought in for, from, according to Keenan in his book, from 400 miles in the surrounding, even the United States, they were in Mexico. They were in Mexico, they were bringing rocks from the United States and so forth, a tremendous enterprise, and they succeeded in two years in controlling uh, the Colorado by putting some dams out there where the breach was, rock dams, huge rock dams that the Colorado, which we had already lost its strength, was not going to move. As you know, if the Colorado uh, increases its stage, it could still move big, huge rocks, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen at that time. It's usually not the way it happened. When there's a flood and it's a big flood, it won't happen again for 10, 20 years. So that, that, they fixed it. They fixed it and they went back. And, and the reason why they had to fix it was because there was a lot of pressure also, political pressure, economic pressure, because the settlers had already, were already there. They were not only going to get flooded, they, some of them had already been flooded. They weren't flooded a whole lot because they didn't let the river do what it wanted to do. Left on its own, the river would have flooded the whole thing, the 13 meters, and then overflow into Mexico. Left on its own, but we didn't do it. We fought it and we won after two years. You can do the calculation, the volume, the flow that is coming in. It's easy to do a hydrologic calculation on those terms or in those terms. The success in harnessing the Colorado contributed to the development of the Imperial and Mexicali Valleys on both sides. With a secure source of water, the desert proved to be very productive, due in part to its mild climate, but also to its plentiful store, plentiful store of fresh nutrients. The downside, however, and this was not really understood at the time, clearly understood. The downside, however, is that in arid lands, increased pr agricultural productivity generally results in increased salt waste. That, now we know there's a drainage manual the drainage ma ASE drainage manual, which was recently re-edited on its second ed, I believe in the year 2012. First ed was 1991, second ed 2012. Very thick book, about 1300 pages. I, I can't claim I read it, uh, but it is a very good book. It tells the whole story of, of drainage, agricultural drainage management, okay? So, so what actually happens is that in the arid desert, since they, they never had any water in the historical time, the nutrients are packaged in all four uh, alkaline, the earth metals and the alkaline earth metal, metals are there together. And we don't use uh, sodium and we use calcium to a lesser extent. We use magnesium, society eats magnesium and potassium. Potassium a lot. Everything, every potassium, we can get it. We can use it because the biota needs it and we eat it with the biota. 
we don't separate it. But the calcium and the sodium are not wanted in the amounts that they appear. So they're thrown like if it was a package. You're thrown away. It's a waste. A waste is something that uh, occurs in quantities that you don't need, right? So that is the problem with the agriculture or irrigation, rather, irrigation in arid lands. Thus, for the past nearly 100 years, the salt waste of the Imperial Valley and the Coachella Valley, the Coachella Valley is right there. Coachella Valley, this is the Imperial Valley. The, uh, there, are major, there are several towns out there, but the larger towns are Brawley and El Centro. And over here, you have the Coachella Valley and the towns are Indio and a couple other towns out there. Eventually, you get into uh, Palm Springs up there. Have accumulated in the Southern Depression a large saline water body. Indeed, the Southern Sea constitutes an artificial monument to the increased agricultural activity. Is it artificial? Yes, it is artificial. Is there increased agricultural activity? The people in the Imperial Valley claim that they are the best. Irrigation, they are the best. They are indeed the best. But they also have the largest dump. And it's not the best, it's actually ugly. Okay, so here we go. You win and you lose again. It is the largest, one of the largest agricultural enterprises ever built from scratch in the last 120 years. But it also has the largest agricultural sewage dump. And really, we at this point don't know what to do with it. We meaning society. I'm sure. <laughs> um, Governor of California would like to get some inkling as to what to do, and there's really not much that we could do. So closing remarks. Will the Colorado River again attempt to flood the Southern Basin in the future? In other words, could the Colorado come in one day and decide to switch right like it already did? Okay, if it does so, it'll flood the Southern Basin. Of course, we will fight it and we will probably win because it, the, the, the stakes are so high that the, 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 the uh, the United States is not going to let that happen. If it does happen or if we're preparing for it, we will fight it. No question about it. No question in my mind. Let me also say that when this thing happened in, the, in 1905, the federal government tried to stay away from it. They, they wanted the California to do it on its own. And eventually they fought and there was a protracted issue as to who's going to pay for this, which is very well retold or told by, in the book by Keenan. And I'm going, I have posted the book by Keenan. I think I already had you guys read it in sedimentation engineering, but not, not all of you took sedimentation. So I'm asking those of you that are not familiar with the book by Keenan, that you put it aside for reading. You must read this book. It's one of the best books in terms of technical best books that I have read in my life. And I read a lot of books. And not, not only is, is it technical, it is also economic and social. So it really is a very good um, uh, means or medium of studying environmental hydrology. Because environmental hydrology is not just water, it's also sediment, it's constituents, etc. So it's a great book. Unfortunately, we cannot, we don't have the time to dwell on it. So I'm just post, I just posted it today. For those of you that are not familiar with the book by Keenan, which is called The Southern Sea, um, to read it. It's, it's a book that could be read in two hours, by the way. You can choose aside a couple hours of your weekend and read the entire book. I, I am almost positive that if you, are, you have the right frame of mind, you will be fascinated by what Keenan says and how he says it. I took uh, almost all his photos and featured on featured his photos on my videos, on my papers and videos that I have written. Okay. A related question, we're finishing up here. A related question is the following. In view of the inherent hydrological risk, should the Southern Basin have been developed at all? That's a very good question. We've done a lot of things over the last 100 years, 150 years. And the question now that we, that nature has come back and said, now pay, uh, sometimes we wonder, should we have done this? Maybe in retrospect, we should not have done it. That is a good question. 
is a question that pops up in some people's minds. Others don't, by the way. They just look into the future and forget about the way or how it happened. And my answer is this. Yes, you, we have no other choice. The way we built society in the last 200 years, we have no choice but develop. Yes, as long as we have to develop because economic development is right next and social development follows through and we have to give jobs for people and so on and so forth and food. So development has to be there. The politicians are going to do it anyway. I do not believe there's any a politician, uh, a, a politician out there that is talking against development at this point. If they do, they won't be elected and they'll be dead, right? So yes, as long as the risks are recognized and noted for the future. In practice, the chances are slim that we may ever get to experience the event. Why? Well, let's take a look. And I finish up in saying in here, in the realm of time engineering, human-driven economic interests are poised to rule over nature's geomorphological truism. It's too long. This is a picture of the Salton Sea, by the way. It actually looks nice in some places. This is right next to what used to be the, the, there was a park out there run by the Park Service, but it died about five years ago. I actually camped over there 20 years ago with some students. Camped, actually, but now it died it, it, because people weren't going to the park because the thing is already pretty much dying, okay? The sea is actually dying in some sense. Okay, let's take a look at here 11. This is very fast, no, first 10. The current salinity of the Salton Sea is about 60,000 parts per million. When I first looked at this number in the year 1997, it was 45,000. So fast forward 26 years, and it went from 45,000 to 60,000, an increase of about 500 per year. It's about 70% greater than the ocean. These numbers are from Wikipedia. Its salinity has been increasing at the rate of about 500 per year, although in the last few years it has decreased because we're not dropping, many, we're not dropping the same amount of water into the Salton Sea anymore, so it is decreasing. Thus, eventually the fish will disappear. The fish have a range of livelihood between, between fresh fish, you know, 5,000, 5, 10,000, 20,000, ocean fish, 35,000. But by the time you get to 50,000, 60,000, those fish are going to die. They're, they can't take it. Eventually, you'll have uh, a new ecosystem uh, consisting mostly of brine shrimp, like the one in Salt Lake. Salt Lake, uh, you go out there Salt Lake and try to get fish, there's no fish, but there's shrimp out there. You still eat the shrimp, by the way. These are hypersaline species. So the, the Salton Sea is, is uh, getting saline, more saline. Of course, anybody with the right approach could calculate it. If we, if we continue less fair the way it used to be, we're going to continue that, which is not the case, by the way. It has been changing already in the last 20 years. Since I started looking at it, it started changing. Not for the good or bad, but it, it started changing. I'll explain that later on. Um, so, uh, and finally, before construction of Glen Canyon Dam in Utah and Hoover Dam, which straddles Arizona and Nevada, the Colorado River had been known to reach peak flow rates of 250,000 CFS, which is 7,100 cubic meters per second. Therefore, the more the more flow, the more sediment. That is called the Colby method or the Colby formula because the, the transport is a function to the seventh power. So, so two to the, to the, anyway, it's a lot of sediment. The more speed, the more sediment. And if you have a flood, the flood's carrying a lot more sediment. So it's not just the water, but the sediment. The concentration is increasing. Okay, large quantities of sediment. That's why it's called Colorado. As long as the Glen Canyon Dam and Hoover are continuing to attenuate the peak flows and hold to the large portion of the sediment in the process of doing that, by the way, it is not likely that the Colorado River will return to the historic peak flows. In other words, the Colorado River could return to the historic peak flows if these two dams were not in place. Not only could return, will return. We say that every 100 years, he would do it. 
But because the two dams are in place and they're still currently operating, thank God, it is not likely in the last hundreds of years this thing will happen. If the, these two dams cease or fail to operate, then I don't know. I really don't know. I, I don't even want to extrapolate because those dams eventually will be full with sediment. And I don't know exactly. I don't know the numbers. It would be interesting. It would be interesting to figure out what the numbers are. I happen to know because in Peru, there's two dams that are full of sediment already, and they're only 50 years old. Okay, so. Elevation of the Salton Sea. I pulled this, this graph out of the web this morning. The web is great, isn't it? I just looked it up and I found out. Because I visited the Salton Sea in the year 1997 with a bunch of people that were working with me at the time. And our, and the level at the time was minus 227. I have a good memory. Minus 227 was a number. As a matter of fact, I argued with the Army Corps, no, with the Bureau of Reclamation on a project that they had put together. And I told them that it wasn't going to work. It was, it was, it was kind of interesting. I don't want to get into that because it's too detailed, too much information. But let's talk about this, okay? In in the year 1997, it was 227 minus 227 below sea level, which is right there. You can see this curve starts at 228, but the 228 starts at uh, 2004. That's seven years later. So from year 1997, nothing was happening until until 2004. Actually, 2006, can you see that? 2005, 2005. In 2006, 2007, it started coming down. Why? Well, I mean, this is, it is obvious that this was going to happen because San Diego successfully grabbed uh, five, me, uh, how many acre feet? They grabbed 5% of the allocation. In other words, uh, I say grab kind of facetiously, really, but uh, we fought it in court and we won. They had to give us 5% of our allocation. I think the allocation was, was 4 million, right? 4 million acre feet per year. So we got 200,000. We successfully extracted from Imperial Irrigation 200,000 CFS. Uh, no, no, 200,000 acre feet per year to feed our our hungry population in San Diego. It doesn't take an Einstein to figure it out that that was gonna last 20 to 25, they say 30. After 30 years, the population increasing here in San Diego, we're gonna go back for some more. We haven't done so because time hasn't gone by and I won't be able to see it. But you guys and other people will see that given time, San Diego will go back and try to extract 200,000 more and Every, every iota of water that is taken from the allocation of the imperial irrigation re diminishes their potential to do irrigation and therefore their potential to do drainage. So that is why this thing is coming down. Can you see that? It's coming down. It's been coming down for, it said that they were gonna go 20 years, so 205, 200, 2025. So it's still ongoing in there. In addition to this, which is not, the story is not, told over here in this graph, maybe. I'm just guessing in here. There's been another problem with, uh, with the operation in the Imperial Valley in that uh, the windmills have taken over or are taking over. We've got to produce these windmills for the sake of combating global warming or global climate change. And where are we gonna put them? The idea is put them in the desert. People won't see them. They'll still generate electricity. There's wind in the desert and so forth. So the South, the Imperial Valley has has been has turned out to be a good choice for windmills. And windmills have been built a lot out there. I've seen quite a few projects and quite a few projects in the making. So my estimation, extrapolating this, that in the future, inch by inch, the windmills are going to start taking the the terrain or the agricultural lands of the Salton, of, of the of Imperial Irrigation. That is going to happen. It's already happening. Thirdly, there's another issue here. The issue of the cell phones. How does the cell phone relate to the Salton Basin? With the cell phones, which uh, currently there's, I think there's six or seven billion cell phones out there. There's about a billion, a cell phone for every person in the world. The cell phones operate with rechargeable batteries. And the rechargeable batteries are constituted with 
a metal which is called lithium. You've heard about it. The lithium, the rechargeable batteries are all operating with lithium. So industry has got to go out there and find the lithium. If you don't find the lithium, you don't produce the batteries. So wherever there is lithium, there's going to be a new resource, new resource. And the, uh, interestingly, there's lithium in the Southern Basin, recently discovered. Okay. The Bolivians have discovered the lithium in uh, Uyuni Lake about 30 years, 20 years ago, and they're proceeding to mine it, mine the lithium and sell it to the world. Now we're going to compete with them. Southern Basin is going to compete with them. Whoever has the lithium is going to extract them, extract it because it is a mineral that is in demand, and they're going to compete in the world market for the supply to the uh, makers of, of uh, rechargeable batteries. So between the lithium and the wind farms, the Southern Basin and San Diego, three, San Diego, the wind farms and lithium are going to create havoc out there and maybe even destroy the, or obliterate, finish the agriculture. How long would this take? I mean, you can extrapolate that stuff. I would say it would take maybe a hundred years. Uh, easily said by me, because I'm not going to be here at that time. But I would say it's going to take some time, but it will, it's, the, the guards are already set there. They're going to lose. They're, they're losing already and they're going to continue to lose. What does that mean for us? I have a minute here. It means that all the productivity and production of the Southern Sea is not going to be there anymore. What is it that they produce? They produce uh, stuff that we eat, food. So the food will have to come from somewhere else. And at this point, I'm not going to speculate where from. I mean, I'm not going to be here, right? It'll be 20, 30, 40 years. But it will have to be replaced by some other place, agriculture in some other place. So with that, I am going to finish here. And uh, we'll, we'll come back on Tuesday, next Tuesday. And uh, I have two other articles on the Southern, which is fine because next week, we have an easy week for me because it's your time, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday is your time. So Tuesday, I'm going to wrap up the two papers that I have. Actually, it's only one paper and then one video. And that will lead us to our next subject, which is the geomorphology, which is really what uh, interests me and fascinates me. I discovered geomorphology when I was in the Pantanal 40 years ago. I said, boy, this is important. Geomorphology produces hydrology, hydrology produces ecology. It's all created by the local geology, so these sciences have to be studied, they have to be understood. Uh, civil engineers study geology a little bit, geomorphology hardly anything, hydrology a lot, and ecology nothing. So take your pick. I happen to have worked in these areas for 30 years, and I know enough to talk about it, enough to understand the relationship between them. Study the, you have to study with an open mind all the papers. At the beginning, when I started my career, I would read three journals. And 20 years into it, I was reading any journal, any journal that would come to my hands that I thought was necessary for me to understand the processes. So I became, uh, I became more of a generalist, but it was good. That allowed me to teach this class correctly, by the way. Okay, so with that, I am going to stop the screen in here.